Social worker and dedicated community activist, Maureen Taylor fights for food, clothing, shelter, light, heat, and water for those in need. She has served as chair of the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization since 1993 and was elected treasurer of the National Welfare Rights Union in 1994. Taylor defends recipients of public aid at the Michigan Family Independence Agency in case disputes and serves as the program director for the Detroit NFI Community Self-Sufficiency Center, a program that works to assist chronically unemployed persons in the Detroit Central Empowerment Zone. Graduating first in her class, Maureen received her bachelor's degree in social work from Mary Grove College in 1983. In 1994, she earned her master's degree in social work from Wayne State University. Taylor has received many awards for her community organizing and leadership, including the National Community Leader Award from the National Black Caucus in Washington, D.C. Marion Kramer has been in the front lines of the welfare and civil rights movement since the 1960s. She has retained her commitment to end poverty in America by empowering the poor, especially women as leaders. She has fought government programs such as Workfare, defended poor women against unjust persecution for welfare fraud, and led campaigns to elect the victims of poverty to political office. She has organized poor people's movements, housing takeovers by people without homes, and led efforts to unionize in the South. She is the recipient of numerous awards for community service and is known as a mentor to college students fighting poverty. Currently, she is co-chair of the National Welfare Rights Union. Marion Kramer and Maureen Taylor take a stand for a new morality in America, where the guarantee of health, happiness, and a full cultural life for every man, woman, and child is a right. They inspire hope and the belief that everyone makes a difference. Hi, my name is Jennifer Lyle, and I'm here talking to Maureen Taylor and Marion Kramer as part of the Global Feminisms Project. And we'll be talking today about your social activism and your, the work that you've done for many, many years. Um, the first question that I have for you both is what led you to the work that you do now? How did it develop? What inspired you to do what you're doing? Now I'll let you go first. Yes, ma'am. I was, um, I'm born and raised in Detroit, Lower East Side of the city of Detroit in a community called the Black Bottom. And in that particular community, the concept there was we shared information and resources and support for each other. And I thought that's the way the world worked because that's what I understood. As I grew older and went to high school and eventually went to college, I learned that the world didn't work that way that there were some other things that were happening and that uh, if you wanted to uh, have a community that was prosperous or at least safe, you needed to do something. Mm -hmm. So at an early age, uh, I became involved in at least an interest, at first a passing interest in politics because I couldn't understand why there seemed to be inequities in terms of how some people lived, others struggled. So as I got older, entered into the workforce, things happened, lost jobs, things just changed and I became clearer and clearer that I needed to be involved in, in a movement of sorts that would deal with this question of uh, racism. I worked on that for a very long time until I realized there came a time that I found out that it, it was something else happening. It wasn't just all white people were bad, all black people were good, there was something wrong with that because I started to meet folks that were in the gray area. And so as I became more involved, it became clear to me that there's a class component to all of these fights that are going on. And in an effort to try to uh, adjust these inequities, I, I've been involved since then, and all of my activities are, are based in my community where I live. That's how I got to be where I am now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kind of mm -hmm. short for Maureen, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, my activity started in uh, uh, Port Allen, Louisiana, which is uh, West Baton Rouge. And at the uh, old age of four years old, my grandfather was slapped three times by his little young, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, boss. 
at the time who was uh, white at the time. And the young man was young enough to be his grandson. And dad always loved baseball. He said, three strikes, you out. Mm -hmm. He kept telling that young man, you're gonna have to respect me. Uh, the young man's orientation was that we were nothing, you know, as, as black, nothing but their property. He hit dad for the last time in this tavern that was located across the street from where we lived on that Chaffalai Street. Um, and dad retaliated and as a black male, man in Louisiana, you didn't do that. And I remember the family coming together late one night, that night, to try to get my grandfather out of Louisiana because mm -hmm. we knew what the end, I mean, they knew, my family knew, my father's side as well as my mother's side, what the end results could be, mm -hmm. that dad would be dead. So dad was um, taken to Dallas, Texas, where his sister out of 14, 15, 14 children lived. But that, you know, and that kind of stayed within me, you know, as a young child, seeing the family come together, my grandmother crying, you know, and folks trying to get it together and, and make sure that I, my grandfather was safe. Mm. But I, I saw a connection there. I didn't understand the collectivity then, but I understand it more. So that was the groundwork for me to kind of stay together within my community and do something good there. But, you know, being born in Louisiana <clears throat> laid the groundwork for me to get involved, period, mm -hmm. because I knew uh, for one thing, there was this whole attitude, you had to be light, bright, and damn near white. That was the tone in order to, uh, to try to fit in, in uh, to an upper level among the blacks there. But, you know, our family was not like that. For one thing, we were all different uh, complexions. Number two, my family was carpenters, uh, cooks, and that type of stuff, you know, or maids or what have you. So, therefore, we didn't make the grade you know, mm -hmm. as, as being that light, bright, damn near white type of attitude. You could be like that, but you had to likewise have some of the economic uh, right. basis. So my mother was the inspiration for us. So when we moved to Dallas, like a year and a half later, mm -hmm. uh, the family, um, the immediate family, like my mother and four children and my grandmother, because my mother and my father during that period of time separated, uh, my mother got us involved in the NAACP. I didn't understand all that, but I know we were involved because the whole church was involved. So, you know, from, from that foundation, uh, you know, I got involved in the civil rights movement, from the civil rights movement uh, in Dallas, Texas, knowing the hanging and lynching and, you know, all that stuff going on into, uh, at Southern University, becoming very active. Don't try to think back what year that is because I might not take I was going to ask you. Yeah, yeah, that was back in the early 60s. Okay. Uh, because I graduated from high school in 1962. I'm looking at Maureen. 1962. But... Uh, just a spring chicken. A chicken, man. that's all I am. Yeah, you know that. Uh, but, you know, my, one of the things my mother told me in going to Southern, because I went back to Louisiana mm -hmm. to stay with my father during that period of time to attend Southern University, um, don't get involved. She became, you know, although we were involved, right. her thing was don't get involved and get kicked out of school. Because okay. all my cousins and all the rest of them uh, were kicked out of Southern University for participating in the rising civil rights movement at the time. Okay. Well, you know, when you say don't, what you do? You get involved. Not only did I get involved, but I became a, a task force worker for the Congress of Racial Equality at the time. I worked on campus. And I really wasn't interested in school. <laughs> I was just interested in that. It was nothing else for me to do, you know. Okay. So not only did I get involved in CORE, but I became one of the uh, active members and staff to try to help involve the community, my family more involved. As okay. the thing intensified, uh, two years later I was sent um, out on one of the task force in the summer and summer projects and that type of stuff. Okay. So, you know, it's been a continuous thing from the civil rights movement, then in, in, in Detroit to uh, being active once I got married and one of those Alinsky type projects and that type of learning organizing, uh, more in depth in the community and that type of stuff, and then to welfare rights. 
Okay. Uh, in the beginning stages of welfare rights, because some of the people in the original uh, organizing around welfare rights, a lot of us came from uh, the civil rights movement to help get that on, on the road and what have you. And I've continued. As the objective situation changed, then so do our strategy and tactics on what we had to do. But I've maintained my membership since the 60s in the welfare rights organization because I felt that's where I needed to be, and that is among uh, the poorest of folks and struggling for them to be able to organize the fight back that needs to take place to free all of us out here. It's, it sounds like y you're organizing. Your work comes from this understanding that you want to give back to a community that you came from. Yes, but I wanna, we want to uh, get the community to fight in their interests. Okay. And the fighting in their interests, we're talking about, just like Maureen has talked about earlier about a class question, we're talking about fighting in the interests of the class. And that is, right now what we're facing in, in, in Detroit and around the country, particularly in Detroit and Holland Park and places where we live, you see all this killing taking place because people are fighting one another, mm -hmm. not understanding concretely who they should be focusing their attention around. We've been involved right. in struggles around the utilities and all that type of stuff, and people are afraid to even come out and are ashamed to say, my water is off. My utilities are cut off because they feel that people that go, are going to look down on them for not being able to take care of their bare, you know, the necessities, mm -hmm. you know, they, because we live under a government that make you feel that that's your fault. So, yes, we want to give back to our community, but in the main, we want our community to get, get so to the point that, that they're engaged that's right. to fighting back and making sure that we have a quality of life that everybody can enjoy. Okay. Can you, I want to go back because you started talking about the welfare rights mm -hmm. movement. And can you talk a little bit about what, what that is, what that, has, what that is, what it's become, and how you, you talked a little bit about how you became involved with it, but can you talk a little bit more about that, how each of you came to it? How did you go? Well, you should start because it was because of you that I became there. You got me there. Tell her what happened in the beginning when you were in what George Wiley and them. Thank you, Mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, you know, back in Syracuse, New York, in the early, uh, back in the 60s, uh, there was a Poor People's Conference in Syracuse. Uh, I just come out of the Civil Rights Movement. I was at uh, the West Central Organization. Uh, there was a Linsky-style organization in Detroit. And the, the community decided that they wanted to attend this Poor People's Conference. And don't forget to explain Alinsky. What yes. does that mean? I will get to Alinsky. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. And um, Thank you. once uh, we got to this conference, we ran into uh, some of the people that had been in core with us. And that was George Wiley. Okay. That was uh, some of the people that was from Louisiana uh, that was on the project with me and uh, as well as with, with my ex-husband. And they pulled us together to meet um, Francis Piven and Richard Clough, who had a concept that they wanted to develop at the time. And they figured that if they talked to us as uh, civil rights workers that had just left, you know, the civil rights movement in the South at that time, mm -hmm. that we would probably come on board and help organize around this concept. We listened diligently. Now, mind you, we had just come out of the battlefield, I mean real battlefield. And we listened and, and we, um, I told them at that time, I could not become a full-fledged worker for welfare rights because I was committed in Detroit to helping out at this community organization as well as my husband at the time. But we would work diligently to help set this organization up within the community. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that was my commitment at that particular time. My first time being around Francis and Richard, um, first time meeting Beulah Sanders, who was at one time one of the second uh, national president of the National Welfare Rights Organization. And uh, there must have been about three to 400 people at this conference, Four People's Conference at the time. But that was like the launching, the beginning launching of welfare rights because all of us agreed that we would make sure that we organized people in the community to come to the first national meeting. Okay. And that was held, at, I'm trying to get it, in Chicago, no, in Washington, D.C., or one of them at the time. 
And I got kind of committed at that time to uh, be involved, although I was committed to this organization, West Central organization, that was the Solinsky style organization. Uh, let me back up. Saul Alinsky was um, a person out of Chicago that at one time was an organizer around Back of the Yards. And Back of the Yards back in the early, uh, I forgot my period of time, early 30s, uh, early 40s, and so I wanted to keep blacks from being able to move in. And Alinsky, being an organizer, if that's what they wanted to organize around, he would do it. Then he, further on, it was the question of the nuns who wanted to organize against uh, being able to, you know, not having to wear uh, the habits and all mm -hmm. that stuff. I remember being in some of those demonstrations to support the nuns, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was that type of thing. But then, too, he, ex he um, further uh, expand, you know, as far as organizing with different communities. Uh, in Chicago, it was around the University of Chicago who wanted to expand and push out the community. That was mm -hmm. a TWO organization, the Woodlawn organization. And, and on, on the, on, um, where I became aware was uh, Northwest uh, Community Organization, where we met Alinsky, and likewise he came to Detroit. And that's what we had in Detroit, but it started changing for him in Detroit, because the situation Ooh. started changing also <laughs> in Detroit. We had a little wants visitor. Wants to get on camera. <laughs> uh, yeah, he <laughs> wants to get on camera too, do you blame him? And, um, so, you know, this is where I came in t contact with Alinsky more so in Detroit okay. and uh, was around urban renewal and trying to push the community out and that type of stuff. And eventually we parted our ways. But uh, likewise, we made sure that welfare rights was a part of this or organization, the West Central Organization at the time. Okay, so can you just briefly describe what is the, the Alinsky model? What, it, what does it entail? Wow, you're taking me back to something. Just briefly. Uh, just well, Alinsky had a concept. And how you used it for welfare rights. Well, he had a concept that, uh, you know, whatever the people wanted to organize around, you know, and the people that we wanted to, that we were working with were interested in maintaining their community. And the people in, in welfare rights that was based in Jeffrey uh, uh, Public Housing at the time, and then the West Central Organization that was um, uh, West Side Mothers, that was formed at that time were basically organizing around uh, being treated with respect and being able to get the necessary programs that, to support them to be able to go to work or to get an education. Okay. Well, and the community I was living is around housing also, that you don't take our housing. So that was the main, th and the Linsky thing was, if that's what people want to organize around, then we organize around it. If they want to organize around a party in the street, we would organize around it. Okay. That was basically his thing, that you organize the people to have a piece of the pie. But our concept was, we wanted to have them not only have a piece of that pie, but make the general decisions concerning our lives, okay? And eventually, you know, Linsky was a very patriotic, type of person really supported the government and stuff so we split on a lot of things eventually you know he was not eventually I remember the last time I saw that man I told him that you know your concept is to organize to have a piece of the pie we want the whole pie and you organize and you ret ret uh, uh, you know usually pull out your um, organizers but I, I believe that the organizers should come from the community mm -hmm you know, and that the community in the final analysis should be the ones that make the decision about their lives and not some high paid organizer that comes in here. So, you know, a lot of his tactics and stuff, we philosophies we, we split on, but we used a lot of his tactics because it, w it would work. Door to door, you know, organizing the, uh, what is it, the block Weekly, clubs block and clubs, all that Weekly. stuff into a motive force, taking them down to the city council. They had never been to city council before. Taking a uh, skunk to a, a meeting at, um, at Wayne State Board of Trustees meeting who we felt that that's how they felt about the community, that we stink and they were going to urban renew us out. So he took us beyond what we could imagine at that time, at that particular time. Okay. And what, what time was that? 
Why are you keeping the system with this time? Is for, but this that's all right. I understand. <laughs> that was, and I'm proud of it. It, mm -hmm. it was during the 60s and uh, okay. uh, early 70s. Okay, so it's still around the 60s. Mm -hmm. And Marina, no, so I guess I, I guess the question can be, I would like to know how you got into the welfare rights organizing, but also can you talk about how you all, how you all met each other, how? See, uh, Marion is considerably older than I am. So by the time I arrived, uh, a, a number of these struggles were already in full bloom. Okay. Uh, I had, uh, um, uh, I was in uh, college and at uh, Highland Park Community College, as a matter of fact, and was involved in a very vigorous, sometimes violent confrontation with uh, administration at Highland Park Community College. And the issue was there were 99% uh, African American students at this facility and no black faculty. And it was an outrage. And you know, students were, were uh, complaining about the cultural problems and, and, and not being able to identify and all of those kinds of things. And at that time, you know, my hair was, I was the best nationalist in town. I'd go outside and the wind would grab my, you know, all of that. So uh, while I was in school and these issues were coming up and I was part of raising these issues because it was an educational component that, that, that I was focused on. How can we get a better, uh, deeper education if, if we can't get an education because the folks that are teaching us and training us and whatnot always have a bad attitude and they live someplace else. None of them even uh, were uh, uh, local folks. Uh, I was still living in Detroit. Highland Park is a small uh, community enclave inside of Detroit that's surrounded by it, but none of the teachers lived there. They were all suburbanites, so they had a, 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 a perspective. And again, at that time, I was looking at this black and white issue. I was off into this fight. Uh, 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 many of our students had begun to get expelled because we were picketing and the police were called. You know, this is something that was lasting over a period of months, and this was intense organizing. Then there came a time where the faculty came forward, the administration came forward, and they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to hire African Americans, and your point is right, and, you know, we're going to start. The next semester, you'll have some um, untenured blacks working here, some untenured women working here. So it's fine. It's a start. So six months later, the students are still failing. They still can't read. The, the, the grades are no better. And you know, now we're into an argument where we're saying, well, what is wrong here? Maybe it's not the individual teacher. Now at the time, I'm going through a metamorphosis myself. It's, in, it's the 70s. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm in Chicago at a meeting. It's a Democratic uh, uh, National Convention, and I'm there. And there's fighting going on in the streets. I'm trying to hit somebody. I don't know who to hit, but you know, I'm there with, the, with whoever's in the, in the audience and in the streets and whatnot. And what happened was, I, I, I'll never forget this, it was uh, you know, police officers at those times, at, at those days in Chicago, they had three feet night sticks that looked like they were yard sticks. And this cop was about to hit me upside my head and a white guy who I did not know, a student just like me, jumped on me and took the blow. Well, that told me, you know, I've never been a stupid person. That told me clearly, wait a minute, there's something wrong with what I'm thinking because, see, this guy didn't know me, but he didn't want the police to hit me upside my head. And he took a serious knot to the head, blood and everything. So by the time uh, I got back uh, to Detroit and began, you know, I thought I need to sit down and review a lot of issues. There's something wrong here. And I began to change some attitudes about some things because it became clear that it's not a black and a white fight. So I started getting involved and looking for changes, found some flyers uh, that talked about uh, we're having some classes, some politics classes, some classes that have to do with politics and the study of economic systems around the world. And, and, and it was a class that was set up, and I looked at it, I didn't know what it was, and you know, made some telephone calls, and it was about then that I found Mary Kramer, and she answered one of those calls, you know, I need to find out about these classes get some information and try to find out what they were. Well, let me fast forward. Went to some classes, some other things happened, a few years went by, learning some things. I went to work at General Motors. I got called in at GM and I was a test driver for a very long time. I was cute, didn't smoke, paid you all the money in the world, I'm going there. So I went to General Motors and I worked as a test driver on the second shift and I was there for a number of years. There came a time when all of our 
shift got a pink slip. We were all laid off at the same time. And I thought, like everybody was told, this is just a temporary activity. Months went by, we're still getting our little money. Uh, unemployment lasted a long time in those days. You had a first extension, a second extension, a triple extension, so you're know, still, still doing fairly well. Came a time, some of my, my uh, colleagues said, let's go out to the Proven Grounds in Milan, Michigan. And uh, somebody we knew who was still working there had a birthday. We went out to visit this girl, and it was only her and another person. All the other shifts had been laid off. We were really surprised. I still had my badge. I went on the grounds. The Proving Ground was where you did the test driving. Proving Grounds at the testing ground, the testing facility in Milan, Michigan. It's a farming community about 40 miles outside, maybe about 25 miles outside of Detroit. So when I get there, there's a warehouse where my track used to be. Now my job was to drive an experimental car 100 times around the track at 100 miles an hour. At the end of the 100th rotation, I had to crash that car into a wall. And this was a wall that had mattresses. So you crash into it, you know, the first 50 times you do it, you, you know, you lose, you know, your, your stomach is gone. But after a while, you learn what this job is. And I was a, a brake and an emissions tester. So I did this job. Now, when I go back out and I visit my plant where I used to work, the Proving Grounds, there's now a warehouse. Wasn't there before. So I went and took a look in the windows and there was a robot driving my car. So it took me about three seconds, hmm, cold outside, dark in there. Robot didn't need any heat, robot didn't need any lights, didn't have to go to the bathroom, Just no time condition. off, didn't need anything. Air conditioning inside the car to make certain that the engines didn't overheat. About five seconds I realized, you know, we're not going back to work here. Not going back to work here. So I came out, Long time went by, all my benefits were exhausted. It's time for me to go to the welfare office because my lights and my gas were about to be cut off. I go to the welfare office, they say, you have to come back when your thing's already cut off. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Now, that's the rules. Remember that crazy girl I met a couple years ago? Let me call that crazy woman. I called Marion. I said, listen, I need some help. I told her what was happening, what was going on. She says, okay, it's the Schoolcraft office. She said, meet me there. It's fine. They're not going to talk to you. She said, meet me at the office. We go there. I'm standing right next to her at the counter. She told the lady, this young lady came in to get some assistance, and you didn't talk right to her. You didn't help her. What's the problem? Rules, regulations. Mary picked up a manual and threw it and hit her. I said, ooh, I got to join this. <laughs> this, this. I got to go here. The woman came back, everybody scattered. They came back and I got uh, uh, money for rent, I got money for gas and lights, food stamps, I didn't ask for those. <laughs> I got all kinds of things. So I thought, now nah, it can't be the fear of this little woman. She was much you know, thinner than. You know, it, it can't that. be that. This is a big woman, she threw this manual at. Can't be that. It must be something else. So I was very intrigued and began to go back to some studies and to try to understand what is the what is the reason why so many people lose jobs? It wasn't my fault, it wasn't my, my colleagues' fault that we all got laid off. Then we go to this state agency who is mandated to help us, and when we get there, they have a bad attitude and act as if it's something we've done wrong. What is the basis of this? I couldn't understand it, I knew I couldn't understand it, but I knew she knew, so I hooked up with her, and that was 25 years ago. Teach me this, because I need to find out what's wrong here been there ever since, welfare rights. And she drove me up a wall ever since then. I'm sure. Yeah. So what, what has it been to work as colleagues and friends, or be friends as colleagues in this, in this work? For one thing, we're truthful with one another. Because we, uh, all the work that we have to do, you know, some people sometimes think that Maureen and I are about to fight each other physically. But, it's, but we'd be battling out tactically how we need to move on something. So uh, it's, it's, uh, the more and more we stay in the trenches and more and more people that we bring and the more and more love that we have for each other as well as cut. You got to stop. That bug is on your Is it? <laughs> right to, uh, on your collar I'm and sorry. almost next to your face. Yes. Now he's gone. Okay. okay. <laughs> you better get him to bring us back in. Mm -hmm. Well, let's 
keep going. Okay, we'll just okay. cut, yeah. cut it later. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I know about bugs. And yeah, I just, sure. didn't, I just didn't want it to bite you, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and you we've know, had I, many victories over yeah, the years yeah. because we worked together. Uh, the tandem team, uh, 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 Malone and, and the other guy, whatever his name was, and Pippin and, and Jordan. You know, it, it really works well with the concept that says because we she work together as a are. team. Oh, these are basketball players. I forgot. Oh, okay. I forgot. Uh, you know, but, you know, if you work together in a collective uh, and work together in terms of uh, management by consensus, it really works. So right. we have had uh, tremendous victories uh, because uh, we play good cop, bad cop. Yes. And, and we used to do that for a long time, but now as we get older, we just bad cop all the time. Now we don't do good cop anymore. Just go in there, just start smacking folks. So right you mean you go in where and play yeah. good cop, bad cop? Well, we go into, you know, um, into the welfare office if necessary to represent probably one or two of our members because welfare rights is a membership organization. But once we arrive there, it might be the whole. Uh, it is. Uh, waiting room of people that we end up staying all day with to make sure that they get quality services and we represent all the people there and not only that we make the uh, workers as well as the district manager work How I mean actually right. work you know because they're supposed to be given people not only service but service with respect and that type of stuff so you know if necessary we have uh, uh, kept some welfare office open for three straight nights, 24, 24 hours, you know. And at the end, quite naturally, they arrested us. But it was not just Maureen and I, but you know, our, some of our past members who have passed away, Diane Bernard. I know I've done it Elmer. in Louisiana with uh, Annie Smart Office and that type overs. of stuff. You yeah. know, that, was, that has always been one of the battlegrounds of welfare rights. And that is at that office level. And then we have to turn around and represent some of those same workers. The workers the who are in the office. Mm -hmm. See, there's some, some <coughs> history to that. We went to um, uh, at one of the offices, and, and it is, it's good history because we were mine workers. You know, don't forget, we were in Inkster, and we kept that office open for 72, 78 hours. Don't forget, and we, we'll, we'll barbecue and bring the hibachi in this place at whatever particular office. So at 5 o'clock when everybody else is going home, you'll be here. But the point is, and it, it, it was, it was, oh, it took me a long time to learn. I, and I had, I know I worried Marion and, and Freddie Nixon and May Payne, some of our earlier members there, you know, these are war veterans. I mean, women who had been on welfare, uh, bad diets, they were all overweight. These were some of the fighters, the backbone of whatever democracy is with these women here. Courage, they you know rebuke you in the name of the devil, and they very religious, and roll their sleeves up and would punch a policeman before you could blink your eye. You know you weren't prepared to fight, That's and right. they just go. But some, some of them, of them uh, were on know, the kidney machine right. three days a week. Courage, uh, Thelma right. Echols, uh, Beulah Sanders, all of them. But they were always ready. They would come off that kidney machine and be sick. You know, Johnny and be ready Tillman. to go, yeah, ready to take over. Lost both of her legs, Johnny Tillman, and that's when I mm -hmm. came in after Mary was given that uh, explanation about the Saul Alinsky uh, oh, model. Yes. Uh, by the time I came along, uh, the Johnny Tillman model, which is the victims of this fight need to be in the management, need to be in control of what happens. Right. And and I was recruited and trained under that model, which is the correct model. Let's mm -hmm. move ahead with the victims of this fight who don't uh, uh, bargain who don't sell out, who don't get scared. The only thing they do is die before we get to where we're going, but they never give up. So I came in under that particular uh, brand, and uh, Johnny Tillman, who I never met, but you know, read many of her writings, she was already in a wheelchair with both legs amputated by the time I was involved in this organization. But it was her and uh, Fannie Lou Hamans and whatnot that said, you know, we, we're gonna go down this street and we're gonna be in charge. And that mm -hmm. was so very incredibly important because the victims of this fight, unless they're in charge of this, you know, they, we, we go into other kinds of waters. But. And these are the kind of women that you generally, that's why I'm glad you're doing this project, because those mm. women are the type of women that people never mm. really, um, you know, you don't read too much about them. But they are some of the women that uh, were in the forefront of protecting uh, human services, right. but at the same time laying the groundwork that they made it better, you know. The situation has changed now. When we started out in welfare rights, uh, I remember I had to go on aid because I ended up with a, um, uh, my first child. 
and uh, my husband and I have shown up was uh, separated. And I ended up at the welfare office, and I knew organization, and I was a part of welfare rights, mm -hmm. you know. I sat up there for 15 minutes before I decided I was going to start something on my own, pregnant and all, you know. I wanted to make sure my child had some, uh, some uh, health care and all that type of stuff. And I walked up to the county and said, um, I, I need to talk with the super, your supervisor. She said, who gave you the right? I said, I'll tell you who gives me the right to ask for that. I'm from welfare rights. Mm -hmm. And within a matter of 15 minutes, it was shock. Everybody in the, other, uh, in the office, we've been sitting there all day long. I was being served. Mm -hmm. Not only be, being served, they were trying to get me out of there. You know, so organization mm -hmm. and, and the question of having some type of vision that this does not have to operate like this That's right. have kept us going, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I'm staying here in welfare rights until there's no need for it again. And, uh, you know, I like, uh, I quote um, uh, Gita West, who wrote our book, mm -hmm. you know, the National Welfare Rights Organization. Gita said, bury me with my boots on. That's right. Because mm -hmm. I'm going down fighting. And, you know, and I'm, I, and I'm proud mm -hmm. for the fact that we had the opportunity to be among those women and be a part of that. But at the same time, uh, you know, you get very uh, angry at a, a situation that here we are. Mm -hmm. I'm 59 years old. I'll be 60 in a, a couple of months. My problem is, why in the hell am I still uh, having to fight like this for our children to have a decent life for the future? Even harder. And much harder. Because we're now facing the situation where I live in a community where, say, 50% of the people were without water. Mm -hmm. You know, it's getting worse. It's not getting any better. So, yes, I must stay in the struggle. I, I wanted to, um, you've answered a lot of the questions that I have, but I want to ask, I remember when you talked about Johnny Tillman, I think about what she said, of we, we go from being beholden to a man and then it becomes the man mm -hmm. or something like that. But one of the things that um, there's this discussion about working for race and class and gender and understanding all of those things. But where I really learned it was under you all, about how you showed me that there's a fight and it's about humanity, it's about right. people. So can you talk a little bit more about how that became part of your vision? You talked about this man protecting you, but you know, I've seen you, you work with disability, you work for women, you work around race, you work around water, all of those things. And that I think that's strengthened your work. And I'll let you tell me about it. Well, you know, originally when Welfare Rights started, we started out as organizing AFDC recipient, Aid to Family with Dependent Children, uh, mainly people on the roads, you know. And that was the objective situation at the time, coming out of the Civil Rights Movement, you know, trying to get these head of the households organized. Situation changed. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of the women, not only did we were able to, uh, to expand the services through struggle, it wasn't nothing that the government gave us. You know, it took struggle right. for this. Uh, you know, being in the trenches, going in and out of jail, you know, that type of stuff. Making sure that, you know, protecting our children, making sure that they're not snatching our children and that. What happened was, the situation changed that a lot of the women ended up in the workforce, you know, getting better jobs. They were already in the workforce, you know, getting better jobs. And uh, with them getting better jobs, and, and eventually technology began to expand. So, you know, an organization like Welfare Rights, which is people don't tend to think of it, is a part, is a part of the labor force, mm -hmm. began to have to change too. So back in 19... Um, well, back in the 70s, you know, we just, uh, the national office ceased, but we maintained a lot of the local organizations. Um, Michigan Welfare Rights was one of the strongest, and that organization continued even today. But in 1987, we formed the National Welfare Rights Union. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that was based on uh, a program that was being implemented in Washington, D.C., we began to organize on a national level against slave labor, you know, forcing folks to work 
off their welfare grant, using welfare, 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 welfare recipients to bring down the whole of the uh, of the working class at that time. And, and you're saying that's workfare, that was workfare. That was workfare, that was, here was called in Michigan the most program. Oh, and, you know, right. uh, Michigan Opportunity Skill tra tra Training Program, big farce, you know, um, because people generally didn't end up with some good quality jobs. But uh, we decided that we had to change, if we were gonna form this national organization, we had been approached by some younger women it was uh, uh, Annie Smart and I mm -hmm. and uh, Arena Edwards and some more of, of the old welfare writers uh, have been approached on a national level. Could we have a national organization again because of the program that was being pushed out of Washington at the time? Economics changing. Uh -huh. Situation change. Things were changing. Mm -hmm. We saw it but didn't know what it was yet. Okay. So we called the meeting. Michelle came in at that yeah. time. We called Tingling a meeting. Tingling Clemens. Tingling Clemens. Tingling Clemens. And we right. fundraised and we had the first founding convention <laughs> at Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. And we complained, we complained there too about the heels and all the stuff we had to go up and down. But we formed the, uh, the uh, National Welfare Rights Union. And we wanted it to be a union because uh, it could not be just people on public assistance like in the past. It had to be a, a unified type of thing between the employed, unemployed, organized, unorganized, folks that were facing the type of problems that poor people face, oh, and yeah. we had to solidify. We had to make sure that we fought for unity there, and this union was that type of thing that we wanted to form. And we began to notice, too, that we weren't needed for work like we once were needed in the factories and places like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. starting to catch on Catch to on that. to yeah. that. What's going on here? So and the downsizing oh, of labor. Oh, it was coming. Yeah. That's it was coming. About. Okay. Because even under the Carter administration, we began to notice what his welfare reform was all about. It was not about what we were talking about. It was beginning the stages of uh, this whole workfare type of thing. And each administration became and started implementing that type, trying to bring it in. We're going to so, help you get off of welfare by getting you trained to do this job over working here. Working off your welfare check. And you can work next to somebody else who's got benefits and, 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 and vacations and whatever else. And, you know, this is going to make you better. I tell you, we saw it before anybody else but didn't know what we were looking at. There was something mm -hmm. changing. Okay. And not only that, uh, yeah. we constantly were struggling for quality child care and that people need to get paid uh, to do that. So we began to see this stuff. And at the same time, in the 70s, mm -hmm. a lot of people were getting laid off from the factories at the time okay. here in Michigan, which was our base. Uh, so we had to even help the workers. I remember being approached at Westside Mothers by the UAW because a lot of their workers had to go in and uh, file for food, food stamps. stamps. And it was Westside Mothers through Selma Good and all the rest and YBET and all and uh, Ella Braggs and stuff had to go over there and help those workers to apply for food stamps. Who had never ex had never any experience had food with stamps. the They system. might have, but okay. you know, and some of them not, you know. Okay. But they had, they didn't know nothing about the food stamp program. Right. But it was welfare rights that was out there helping them to be able to uh, go through the necessary process and, and get eligible for food stamps. You know, and then we began to see as uh, we began to organize the National Welfare Rights Union that under the National Welfare Rights Organization, that was a reserve army of unemployed that people could play with in and out of the factory and, you know, and that type of stuff. But what we began to notice is the advancement of technology. And as robots, just like Marina described in the beginning, began to take over these jobs, they have become a permanent army of unemployed. That's not meant. ever going back to work Never where they used will be to able go. to work. So we, we didn't catch it but knew something was going on, and I, I'm, I'm still fresh in the organization. I knew I was off. Been two, three, four years, my whole shift was gone. The second shift was gone. The midnight shift had two people that were maintenance, and the day shift had one person that was maintenance. So there was three people that replaced about 700 individuals and all robots. Still didn't get it. You know, never saw a condition where productivity all of a sudden began to overtake everything. And here we are living in Michigan, and all these factory workers are off, and they're calling and talking about food stamps. Mm. Even um, don't get it. sheriff deputies 
They were getting laid off. Getting laid well, off. they were going. They were facing lay, uh, layoff, but they, they refused to be laid off, and they continued to work out of protest. Right. They were facing child support. They were facing uh, uh, the possibility of losing their homes and all that type of stuff. Called welfare rights. And they called well, yeah. They called legal services and welfare rights. So. And we had to help them to uh, how to impact those services and stuff. So some of them were at the point in Wayne County. Sheriff Department of saying, look, Mary, and I go in there with my pistols on. I say, hey, that's not going to get you nowhere. We've been fighting this for years. But, you know, maybe I want you in there when I go in there, <laughs> you know, that type of stuff. So this is the time when uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, massive uh, exploitation and, and removal <coughs> of factory jobs, we're off into this now. So we're talking about something that was starting 25 years ago. And, and all of the uh, factory workers that lived at the, in, in, the, in and around the Detroit area throughout Michigan, the factories are starting to cut down. And, and we're looking at it, and it's not like it used to be where factory workers get, you know, off for changeover for two or three days for a week, then they come back. It wasn't that. Factories were closing down and moving to other parts of the country. And things began to happen. And again, you know, when you're in the midst of the whirlwind, you can't, you know, you don't know, you know you're in a whirlwind, but you don't understand what's going on. And, and it came a time where, you know, again, because we're, we're talking, we're studying, and Marion is in contact with the uh, welfare rights uh, 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 members across, you know, we've got these uh, uh, affiliate members at states have welfare rights in, in New Orleans, welfare rights in California, welfare rights in Arizona, Washington, uh, uh, D.C., uh, Seattle, Washington. And she's calling folks and we're getting information. Wait a minute, there's a trend going on here. What's happening? People are being laid off all over the place. All of our members across the country are doing food stamps for factory workers, for meal workers, and people are being off work. And we've got all these workfare programs where they want you to work off your grant. And, you know, as it became clear and clear, this productivity issue, where now they don't need us to work anymore. So you don't have, what, what do you need health care for? You can't produce anything for them, so let's remove that. What do you need education for? You can never serve this master anymore. Why should we care if you can read and write? Just take that away. You don't need housing and clothes. You, you, it's all right to stand on a corner with a sign that says, we'll work for food. 20 years ago, you never saw anything like that. And now we got all, we have families standing on street corners. The woman and the child, veterans, signed the baby standing right there, we'll work for food. Now it's becoming clear that this is a, a national, this is an international move to make a change. Welfare was always an employment program. You stayed on it for a period of time until you found a job, you got off, you went to that job, and you continued your life. Now things change. It was a time that you could live on welfare. You could stay on it and live on it where you could eat, benefits, housing, get some clothes, get some things for your children, some shoes, and you could work. Bit by bit, they start breaking those things down. And I, I would, you know, I didn't see it. It, it was Marion, it was Yvette Line Barger, it was some of our members and whatnot that had much more experience in learning what these things were to tell us, look at the facts, don't take our word for it, here's what's going on. There is a dismantling of this social service system. We get to August 22nd, 1996, and Bill made... Playboy Clinton. Yeah, I won't even say it. Bill President. Clinton. Mm -hmm passes this or signs into existence forever. Welfare reform bill, what's the name of it? Marion is the only one in the whole world that knows the whole name of this bill. What's no, it called? No, not if I can remember, Personal Responsibility and Reconciliation Act. She nobody Work opportunity. Well, something like no, that. She no, she's the only one that knows that. I don't All remember right. that mess no more. And he signed this bill into effect, and because he was a Democrat, well liked, he could play the saxophone, he put on Foster Grant glasses, and whatever else it is that was going on, people liked him. If a Republican had a tried, and then he did, to, to, to submit such a law, the whole country would have been up in arms. But because this was a, a you know, good looking Democrat, nobody said anything, and it laid the groundwork for whatever else that needed to fall apart, this crushed it. You know, Let me ask really you about 1999. Um, I'm talking about when you took a de de delegation mm -hmm. of folks to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, um, the Declaration of the Poor People's Economic Human Rights. Human Rights. So what is that, it, and what, what were you doing at the UN? Okay, we got to back up. We just didn't go to the UN. Okay. See, let's back up. 
1987 was the beginning of the National Welfare Rights Union. 1987, too, we realized that what had happened in our hands, we had the National Welfare Rights Union that mm -hmm. represented one, uh, you know, uh, a different constituents of people that was in the National Welfare Rights, I mean the National Union of the Homeless that came about, too. Okay. And uh, some of us ended up on the same board, which was the National Anti-Hunger Coalition. It's a third which, group. That's mm -hmm. a third group, which dealt with providers and, and, the, and, the, and the people that they served, you know. And I was sitting around, and I told uh, Annie that one night, I said, guess what? We have at our hands all three organizations, and we can call a summit to deal with just what um, Dottie Stevenson and them had been dealing with, the campaign that we had adopted on a national level, up and out of poverty okay. now. Because not uh, our sisters uh, and brothers, our sisters in uh, Massachusetts have designed and, and, and nurtured this campaign that we made it a national campaign. So we called a summit back in 1989 you remember that? I remember that. And in Philadelphia, we wanted it in Philadelphia because this is supposed to be the foot of liberty, right? Say brotherly love. Love, mm -hmm. you know, but we knew the, home, the National Union of the Homeless, we wanted to bring to the forefront how homelessness was increasing in this country. Hey, and so we uh, called this National Survival Summit. At the same time, Mitch Snyder had called me about prior to that, earlier that year, about the march on Washington. They came from the homeless themselves, you know, about the need to have this. And uh, which night of the homeless African. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we told them, yeah, we would participate, but uh, we knew, I didn't even go to the meeting. We said we would follow whatever the homeless said. We followed the homeless union. We designed mm -hmm. and began to carry out this campaign. We had a, a, a summit in Philadelphia where 500 people made it their way to that summit. We didn't, uh, the only grant we received to help us with the summit was from Reverend Yvonne Dell, who was a minister in UCC, United Church of, of Christ. Uh, and she gave us $10,000, which we used to help poor people to get to that summit. But basically, a lot of people had to fundraise themselves to get to the summit. We came out of that summit and decided Certain campaigns need to take it, take, uh, begin to be organized. We wanted everybody up and out of poverty in the United States, in the world, really. That was the slogan. Mm -hmm. up and out of uh, we were going to participate in the um, homeless march, mm -hmm. but our demand was going to be that the homeless had to speak for themselves and lead that march. Mm -hmm. We had people from the peace movement. This is when we expanded. We had people from the homeless. Uh, struggles. We had providers. We had uh, welfare rights. I'm all getting it. Well, welfare. All the welfare rights were there. We had people from unions that were there. That's right. Uh, we had what was so interesting. Some of these people had never attended no kind of conference before in their lives, you know, and they were at this at this summit. And then we united. Eventually, we got, were called in by the National Organization for Women. They joined. Uh, some of the other organizations joined into the campaign. But that began to help us to see that we weren't going to win here in the United States the whole question of coming up and out of poverty. Here come little Dottie again out of Boston. Say, look, we have to look at this whole question. Because remember, one thing I love is we, we can get in a room we can fuss, we can party, we can do everything. We're going to come out of that room with a plan. And that plan was that we had to look at the question of poverty and looking at our human rights being violated. That's right. And link those two. And link them. So in New Orleans, at a national board meeting, we decided that we were going to start organizing around the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that under that, that we wanted that implemented in the United States to be the basis for the begin to eliminate poverty. Out of that, uh, Kensington Welfare Rights, which is a part of the national, began to design, take, began to organize around it, and we began to advance this whole campaign around economic human rights. 
and that became the first fight around going to the, to the UN, the march. And that's how we ended up at the UN. We began to take from Boston, a Boston campaign, who started this whole Universal right. Declaration of Human Rights mm -hmm. struggle. These complaints that we began to interview members about their human rights being violated. And through that, we took it to the UN and, and, and filed those complaints with the UN for them to take some action on this. Have they taken any action? We've gone to the UN three, three times, times. Mm -hmm. with different individual complaints, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of paper and, and complaints written out uh, from all across the nation, internationally, just uh, hundreds and hundreds. This is what happened. This is how it happened. This is why it happened. Document everything three times. Took them all thousands of pieces of paper. And it's still going on. They're because still investigating. And, you know, this thing about uh, Kensington, Kensington is still spearheading that, you know, Poor People's Campaign and that type of stuff. And we had, a inter we had an international Poor People's ca uh, Conference uh, summit in, in um, New York where we, again, took, you know, was focusing on human rights violation. A lot of our people have gone to different conferences around the uh, co world, you know, to bring up the question of poverty in the United States. Same I issue. know when we were invited to participate in um, Uganda at one time, we brought up the question uh, at the Seven Pack Pan-African Conference. One of the things we brought up was the question of homelessness in the United States. We made sure that Leona Smith, who was the president of the National Union of the Homeless, became our spokesperson on, on the uh, governing all, uh, body at that because they could not conceive homelessness yeah, in the United States, you know. They, all they remember was the, uh, what's the thing, Bill Cosby show? The Cosby show. The Cosby show. They thought we all lived like that. Land you know. of the free, uh, brave, money, jobs. So it was a street. shock to them to see what Sound we like were heaven, facing, more you know, than, you know America, yeah, facing here in the United States. So, um, you know, we, we still have a long way to go, but we have made these connections. Uh, we even went to the Continental Front for Community Organization. We're part of that effort, where you have all the, all the, all the countries uh, and what have islands, you from, from, from the Caribbean islands and um, you name it, South America, North America, and all this. We all come together and try to look and uh, it's the united community and all that, you know, trying to work with each other and get some strategy and tactics from each other. We mm -hmm. became a part of it because I think it's to bring up this question of poverty, bring up the question of homelessness and how we have to begin to organize and fight back on this. You know, we've been instrumental continuously in the <coughs> 90s. We came out of that. Not only did we talk about uh, the whole question of, of uh, coming up and out of poverty, but our people became some of the best people in, tr in taking over housing. You got all these public housing sitting out here. Empty. Empty that uh, the utilities were on, and you have homelessness on the increase, but they can't go into public housing. Too but yet and people, still, we're paying for those public housing. Too many people living in shelters. It's just it's madness. You know, shelters are full. People living on grates, boxes over their head, and you stand up and you look in the middle of the night, and all the, pub, the, all the public housing uh, apartments, lights the lights mm -hmm. are on, and they're empty, and there's heat, and it's electricity, and the water's running. It's just absurd. So, you know, it, 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 was, it was more than an issue uh, to raise all these points, but at every venue, when you talk about the United Nations, everything, and you, could, you, know, you know, you've been to so many of these, you know, we move this fight around everywhere. And, and it's always the same fight, you know, poverty, people not being able to go to work, you can't make $50,000 a year at a job, then you get laid off from that job and you find another one that pays $12,000 a year, something's gonna happen. Can't make it 12000 if you're used to making fifty. If you have a job and, and it pays $40,000 a year, then you get a job later on that pays $12 a month because that's about what your income is used to, mm. then why is that your fault? Why should you lose your house? Why should your children be taken away? And now we have this kind of circumstance, which pretty much that's the case. Uh, Highland Park used to have 60,000 residents in it, 16,000 residents live there now. They charge people in Highland Park for water based on a figure that says 60,000. And they don't find it wrong. We've got in Detroit, between June of uh, 2001, June of 2002, 
40,752 addresses had water turned off. 40,752 re registered addresses. And of those, about 39,000 were homeowners. Some uh, the, beyond that, oh, 36,000. There were two or 3,000 that were businesses and some are community organizations that lost water, about 36,000. Now, it's 365 days in a year. 36,000 addresses, homes being turned off meant that the water trucks were moving down the street. Flatbed trucks, that's the only thing we, we could figure. They jumped off, turned the water off, the truck kept moving, then you had to jump back on again because that's the only way you could disconnect that, that kind of water. When we challenged, you know, through a period of uh, information gathering and whatnot, friends had to help us, we challenged the water department and we, we found out who was in charge and went to these people and said, what is the problem here? I said, that's right, what about it? They couldn't pay the bills. If you can't pay for water in Detroit, you can't have it. That's the circumstance we're living under now. Human rights violations that nobody cares about because it represents low-income people. Nobody cares that women are having babies in front of the hospital, can't get in there because they don't have health care, because it's, these are poor women. Now, what, you know, we started this conversation off about Mary, and Marianne raised this issue about killings. Hmm. We've got uh, 51, I guess it's 60, 54, 90, 60, 60, 60, 60. 60 uh, uh, killings over, well, in the beginning, the first figure they gave us was 51 deaths over 50 days. 51 killings in Detroit. over 50 yeah, days in Detroit. But that only represented, like uh, the sheriff told us, it only represented those that died. There were two or three times as many people shot. But the, the tension in not just Detroit, all of these places where people had jobs and had incomes and had families and had hope and had pop possibilities and opportunities and visions across the nation we've fallen apart and we continue to try to hold these no good backstabbing, no good dogs, may they die burning hell, Democrats and Republicans responsible for fixing this mess and they all have health care, we pay for it, mm -hmm. they all have utilities, we pay for it, the children they got, you know, Quality children. education. They got wives, girlfriends, sweethearts, mistresses. Sometimes they live in the same house. We pay for all of that. That's what this fight is about. So we are, the, the generations coming, like you're saying, are, are becoming accustomed to a way of looking at people that it's, it's okay to see a family on the street. Or, or that it's, right. it's okay to have water turned off. So the work that you're doing, how is the work that you're doing affecting and impacting this generation to have a different vision of how people should be? When Marion talks about how the women are uh, that uh, are raised up uh, uh, were the banner carriers, the May Paynes and uh, uh, the Johnny Tillmans and the Beulah Sanders and, and uh, Freddie, especially Freddie, man, man, Freddie Nixon was my hero. And, Diane Bernard and you know tearing up now just thinking about them. We we are these women now, and and because we are these women now, we have an obligation to make certain that these folks that are coming up behind us and we don't do a good job at it because it, the 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 struggle is so humongous. This this thing is just all consuming, but we have a responsibility of letting folks know that we remember what service looked like. We remember what humanity looks like. We remember what love and compassion and caring looks like. We remember what opportunity looks like, and it's not what they're showing you out here. This is not the way we're supposed to live, and we don't have to live this way. And to be able to convince people, I don't care how many times you go and watch somebody get shot on television, that actor gets up. That is not what is common. That's not what happens. If you shoot somebody for real, they're going to lay there for a while. We don't have to live this way. Electricity, gas, and water, our rights and should be made available to everybody here. It doesn't have to be a question of DTE owns all the electricity. It happens because we blinked. That's what our fight is on a regular basis. This is not a replica of what life is, what we see out here. This is not what it is. We can live fine. We can go to the movies for a dollar. We can have popcorn for 15 cents because these people have, and that would be us, have developed the ability to be able to manufacture everything we want. They can build a house in 15 minutes, prefabricated. They can build a car. We can all drive. What is this that we're living under? It's because of this horrible corporate greed. And that's what this fight is. And it's a difficult fight because the enemy's very good. The enemy's got all manners of, 
of money and resources to try to convince people that all you see on television is what actually the reality is. The final analysis here we fighting, demanding that people in Iraq have demo uh, democracy. They don't want it. We're going to force it. You're going to take this democracy along with Bechtel and Halliburton, and we're going to set up these oil a rigs, and you're going to deal with it or else. Now, the folks in Haiti demanded democracy. We can't go there. Mm -mm. Guess not. No, no oil, mm -mm. no nothing we don't want. So, and, and that is the fight. How do we clearly delineate and explain this is the wrong information. It's yellow. It quacks. It waddles. If you conclude that it's a horse, it's something wrong with you. It's not that. They got all the signs of being a duck, and it might be that a duck it is. That's what the fight is. So how do you do that? How, do you, how okay. are you fighting that Very fight? Very carefully. Just back up. Uh, you know, when they moved to eliminate general assistance in, in Michigan, we had to change our whole tactics of what we were doing at the time. We were trying to lobby and, and get the... Um, legislative not to support what uh, Engler was doing at the time. And I got a call at 1 o'clock at night from, uh, at that time, Representative Hollister office saying, in the wee hours of the night, they had this legislative, uh, this legislative came together and passed the elimination of general assistance. We say, uh-oh, mm. the plan's changing now. We called a meeting. The I got on the phone at, at 2, and I was good for waking people up mm -hmm. at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and say, look, mm -hmm. we got to have a meeting in the morning because our plans must change. We're not going to Lansing. And then we came out with, look, it's tent time, mm -hmm. that uh, we knew, barring from our sisters' organizations in, in Philadelphia, the National Union of Home, they had pitched a tent for, for a long time out in front of City Hall, we said we was going to pitch a tent right down and across from public housing. Because if you're going to cut general assistance... What was general assistance? And general assistance was individuals and uh, uh, childless couples that were eligible for a mere, it was really small, 200 and some dollars a month to take care of their needs. Everything. And I know that don't happen in a lot of other countries, but this was some of the... Um, uh, um, this was based on, on some of the, the wealth that labor had created, you know. So and general assistance was started here by, uh, in the 1930s, to help workers uh, when they were on changeovers, mm -hmm. you know, in the factories and stuff, like some changing income. the models mm -hmm. and stuff. So, you know, when they looked at it, people say, oh, yeah, those are uh, hmm. uh, young uh uh, lazy young men need to be cut off. That was crap. Because, uh, you know, when there was plenty of jobs, people worked, you know. So it was the beginning move up along with what Clinton was doing to eliminate some of these vital needed programs. We not only pitched a tent, we, we organized, we had various organizations. The hunger, we always start with that first because welfare rights theory has all, I mean, our tactics have always been the streets, uh, the legislative and, and the courts. We had people coming as far as Lansing bringing tents, bringing different stuff that we were going to have for our D-Day. Our D-Day for pitching this tent and beginning to take over houses was Veterans Day, November the 11th. My birthday. <laughs> November the 11th. We took a busload of folks to Washington to hook up with some of our other up and out of poverty uh, uh, people, and we took Washington with a stone. No permits. They said, what are we going to, I had lost my voice, remember. No permits, no nothing. We, we said, we marching down Washington, D.C., and we're going to go straight to the, uh, uh, to the state capitol. Uh, we, like, we don't give a hoot about permits. Because they put us in jail. You can't do that. You can't hey, that's a permit. free place for Watch a lot of our people. Watch this. <laughs> and they kept coming to us talking about in the middle who, of the street. who is the spokesperson. We always said, they're in the back. <laughs> they're in the back. And we kept marching in the most busiest time of Washington. We stopped the street, all the stop time. Everything. And you know what I was so proud about? That was women in the forefront That's of right. it. Not only did the women take over yeah, the, uh, the homeless uh, uh, march uh, in the early period of time where we locked arms and took it to the front and demanded that the homeless had to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. But it was women that were in the forefront of this. 
and it was uh, diverse. Uh, that made sure like we said if, if they come, Everybody. we had it. We had it, if they come to you, tell them to go to the back. And the police just gave up. Say I don't care. And I remember uh, the district police saying to uh, the federal uh, officer, "Say mm -hmm. you got them you now. Do you do something with them. You're joining know? the march and everything." But this was all in one week, and we were fighting back to keep people from Michigan from being arrested because they we had D-Day here. Mm -hmm. Our people got so angry when they got to the state capitol. You know, we have one member named Annie Chambers. Uh, <laughs> Annie is a warrior. <laughs> Annie is not only a warrior, Annie is the mother of 24 children. And Annie got more energy than all of us. Annie is 55 now. I mean, 65, 65. now. But Annie got, uh, just got out of the hospital. She was so angry because they kept telling us, you can't be on, that, on those stairs because those are the senator's st stairs. That's where they walk. That's, that's for them. And they say, boo, I paid for those stairs, and yeah, I'm still stairs. paying for Sit those stairs. I steps. have a son that was killed in the Vietnam War and don't even know where he's buried and stuff like that. I paid for those, that's and right. I'm going to sit my butt down on these stairs. And I knew. I said, oh, Lord, here we go. Annie sat down. When Annie sat down, sister, uh, one of the nuns sat down from mm -hmm. Philadelphia. She I looked around, was everybody down. was sitting down. I said to Maureen and to uh, Diane, mm -hmm. get the Detroit and Michigan people back because I know what's going to happen. We're trying to get arrested too in Washington, D.C. I said, <laughs> we can't do this. So the people, you know, our people were arrested, our, uh, you know, from Philadelphia, from Washington and stuff like that. And we got the people from Michigan back here because on D-Day, not only did we pitch a tent, a t I mean, this was one of those tents that they have those uh, uh, revivers you know in. Right. See, you think right. a tent is a regular thing. You get an L-shaped tent. One of the tents that was about you as big as two studio. bedroom tents, you know, no. No, 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 we <laughs> got two of them. Stuff. <laughs> and, and, at, and, and people said, where you got the money from? People were bringing money because they were a part of the Up and Out of Poverty, Michigan Up and Out of Poverty Coalition, and they were helping out to help, but if you couldn't be there, you at least was donating some. And I remember I had been fired from Michigan Legal Services, and they had to pay me back all my money. So I was helping. We were putting everything we could in it. Yeah, the day of D Day, the, day, the yeah. man pitched the tent for us, and we knew that a lot of people were off in Detroit because it was Veterans, Veterans Day, day. Uh, Federal Holiday. Looked up, here come the chief of police. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. We say why. This is private property. We say we know it. So you got to have a permit. We say, how do you know we don't have the permit? It's a holiday. You can't tell you we can't have one. You can't tell us not. nothing. Everything is closed. We you pitched know. that tent. We had those tents. They were great. Uh, everything you can imagine in those tents. They were, uh, the, the homeless, they got together, that these tents were locked together and everything. And there was a conference that they remember, mm -hmm. a union conference, asked me. And we had a, a press conference. We had our fatigues on, because like Diane said, we were in war. We were in war. It looked like we were in war. We were in war. Cute little hats. Yeah, and we marched. Everybody that came to the press conference, some of the officials from Detroit, and then we marched all the people over to public housing, and we took over public housing again. This was our third time doing it. We took over public housing and began to stay there all. We made the police stay up there all day long. They didn't know if to arrest them, it's not to arrest them, what to do. What do we do? Here's some nuns here and everything. What do we do with these people? Not only did we move people in, every day people were being arrested. We kept 10 city, and this is key. Like Maureen said, we stay out here. This was a protracted struggle. That's right. We started on November the 11th of 1991 in that struggle because they had eliminated general assistance. In our first demonstration, we took over the media because they refused to cover what was happening at the time. But we started with Ten City that day. November. It, it took on a housing struggle in Detroit. And every night we were attacked by the police, but we began to even win them over. And then uh, Flint, it became a... Uh, uh, Homeless. A homeless uh, just uh, struggle, and, and the workers from the factory constantly kept coming. And Ann Arbor, hmm. students. the students helped out with it. Tents up. 
and we had the tent city here. And in Lansing, it became a constitutional struggle. Right on the grounds. Right on the, the grounds of the state, state capitol. capitol. On on uh, December the fifth of that year, England we had to pinch pinched that every tent day. every day, <laughs> and that's why we we ended up with the embassy for poor people. And if you want to know what poor people want, come to Tent City, okay. and we kept those tents up until Good Friday, April. We kept them in court. We, we made sure that the tent company would pay. We sued Coleman Young and got uh, uh, monies back for that. We paid the tent. The tent people said, look, whatever. See, the police had already come in and destroyed the tent. They, did, they arrested and, the tents. And arrested the tents. That's what they did. And one of the first charges was that the tent uh, wasn't properly ventilated. And you know, when they were making the charges, we were standing in there and the top of the tent was flapping. Was you know, cold. the wind's coming through not ventilated, you know, you know it, it, it was madness, so they tore the tents up. And, and uh, so many of our, our colleagues uh, made a decision, you know, if the, if the tent is going to be arrested, I'm going to go with, with the, the tent. tent. I mean, it was something. So we go get another tent, come back and set this up, and the next time it was uh, next to uh, a church with the pastor's permission. So here police come, fighting and arguing to keep this tent up, and what's the charge? Well, you have this tent on the, uh, uh, the grounds of the church with the owner's permission. Who was arrested? Well, that, that, Diane, that, that, and as well as you know, the minister's <laughs> wife. <laughs> this went on, this went on. The other thing that happened, homeless were coming in to get service and we fill out applications and food stamps app applications and giving people information about where you can go to get a house and all this kind of thing. Turning on there. And, and it was a food issue. You know, how are we gonna feed this? So we went back to the, you know, loaves and fishes. You know, somebody gonna have to help to get on TV. So I tell the people, we got this tent open and the homeless are coming here for shelter. We can't feed them. Oh Lord. What do we Every do we hospital, the homeless were are getting gonna... fed duck a la orange, <laughs> a, a, a lobster bisque, Pancakes I show up in the morning, pizza. <laughs> food, I mean food, I mean, you know, you had, you had to make a reservation to get in the homeless tent because the food was magnificent. <laughs> it was truly great and it was breakfast, lunch and dinner. We had a floor model TV, yeah. somebody donated a 27 inch floor model television, had a generator, somebody donated that, turned the television Some on, the council had TV guides, the, uh, being newspapers delivered to the tent. This was an event. CNN said during that year, that that was the third most important Point. story of the nation, mm -hmm. that tent going up from November to uh, April. And That's what we this could fight not, is. Now, understand, <laughs> we could not get coverage from the media right. in Detroit and in Michigan. We got coverage from, ja from the Japan, Canada, um, Australia, and, and oh, yeah. Australia, all over the place. And they but finally broke when we, you know, they knew that we were not going to take them not covering this the more. You had some conscious reporters that began to unite with this struggle. We had people driving all the way from Upper Michigan, ending up with just $14. I remember this couple. They just wanted to touch the tent and be a part of the tent because mm -hmm. they began to see and embrace this struggle. It's their struggle because they knew if we didn't fight for housing and for homeless people to be able to have jobs and housing, that they were next. Mm -hmm. You know, we had people donating Mink coats. Now, what do we need with mink coats? Oh, suburban you know? mink coats. Mink Remember coats. Ted Nugent? Ted Nugent, yes. the rock star? Yeah. He went out and shot deer and whatever else he did. Brought all and, that. And he showed up with venison. And the first time, I didn't know you could make chili out of deer. <laughs> yes. He showed, up, he showed up with boxes of food and all this kind of stuff. But, I mean, you know, it, 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 was, it was gratifying because you could see that the message was being heard. You know, I mean, uh, suburbanite women would show up. I was so upset, and every I heard about this, and I was just outraged. And I have these things; it's not much. You bring it, meat coat. So what, what is we this? Did, you know, we were getting over. Just we food. was getting too much, and we became the suppliers for the shelters. Hey, go get another tent. Put the things in there. And and give it away and to give other it shelters. To, say, take. Okay. Don't bring it here. Take it to these shelters. Okay. We ended up with sleeping bags, everything. It showed us. The, the warmth. They gave us those jackets. Yeah, the warmth of the work, uh, of the people out here. Didn't want to see it. They did know? not support homelessness. Right. And you said it right. They forced it. You know, in essence, people didn't got used to this, and that's criminal. That's immoral for that type of stuff to happen. And we're fighting that because to us, not only have we experienced what life could be like, but I, we want life even better. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, and you, we do have that type of vision, that we can have life better. 
And that's what we're all about, you know. And like I said, bury us with our boots on. I always tell my daughters, don't use no money to put me in no grave. Mm -hmm. I don't believe supporting a, uh, uh, funeral homes and stuff like that. Y'all use that money to live, mm -hmm. you know. We're but, you know, the up. best thing you can do out. for me as a daughter, and, you know, now I'm a new mother um, <clears throat> because of Clinton's, welfare reform, uh -huh. and all these young women uh -huh. out here, I'm losing my voice, that ends up with their children snatched because of water, because of the fact they might need some kind of medical attention. I ended up being a new mother uh, four years ago, my husband and I, with uh, some babies, you know. And I needed babies like I needed a hole in the head. I was rejoicing that my last of the five was gone, you know. Uh -huh. But I have new baby, you know, my, my, what, one is three? Three, five, and nine. I'm just I've three, had them four years. Nine. Four years, and we're just a part of what is beginning to grow out here. You, you've said a lot of time, many, many, you've mentioned many, many women yeah, who have been about of this, this movement. Um, you're talking about how women are affected overwhelmingly by this mm -hmm. movement. And I wanted to know, do you feel that the work that you do can be understood as feminist? Well, probably there would be a a perspective that uh, 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 folks would uh, might want to view and interpret the work that we do with a feminist uh, 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 bend to it, and that would uh, that's only because uh, the way history has now mandated that women are poor. It didn't have to turn out this way. But because the majority of the folks that we work with, particularly in welfare, are women who are, are, they are women who have these children. So you know, eight out of ten of our uh, customers, of our of our uh, uh, clients, are are women. And to the degree that you know people want to look at it in that kind of box, it could be looked at as a feminist kind of activity. But I think that our position would be that we we uh, uh, feminism is is a narrow point of view. We're much bigger than that. We're internationalists. Not interested in men being poor either. We ain't trying to find out how to figure out how to just free women. We want to try to figure out how everybody who is struggling to eat, like eat, housing, all these kinds of issues, that they all have a way out. So to the degree that our fight and our movement and our activities are based in a destruction of this economic system. I mean, you know, I know that this, uh, you explained to us earlier that uh, some uh, 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 Poland, and some of the other countries and whatnot that might be participating in this activity. And we're so proud and humbled to be involved, but let, let, let us make no mistake. We hate capitalism. Hate it. It's no good. What a passion. Hate it. This, this concept <coughs> that the free market let it decide. The free market don't decide nothing but how to keep you poor. We are for a system that says everybody, if you live through the birthing process, you have a right to have health care, housing, take a trip to Bermuda if that's where you want to go to, you know, all of these kinds of things if you lived, and that's what needs to be the key. So to the degree that uh, we're women, and, and, and sometimes we're feminine women, you know, we wear a little cute stuff every now and then, but that is not the focus. The focus pr primarily is to talk about the international relief of this question of poverty, and we can't do that if we section off a part of the group. So. But, you know, even... Um, when you look at it, uh, our organization, majority of them are women, but it's uh, a lot of men in there. But again, you know, like uh, even at the Continental Front for Community Organization, I've always told those men, you know, a slave that get a weapon and don't know how to use it deserve to be a slave. That's right. If you think for one minute that you're going to be free as a man and and not and, and uh, that I'm going to still be your slave, you got another thing coming, brother, because. I'm going to be right there with you on equal terms, you know. And if you want to classify it as feminine, I don't care what you classify it, but if you begin to move just like the enemy, you become my enemy, you know. A lot of people are afraid of that word, the F word, feminism. You know, uh, why? Because, it, you know, they don't figure that women uh, should be a part and have the rights and, and, and that type of stuff that uh, uh, men uh, have enjoyed. Not so much black men, you know, and they too uh, have enjoyed at our expense. Mm -hmm. You know, we're f fighting for a society mm -hmm. 
and uh, for that we do not embrace no exploitation and oppression. Anywhere. Anywhere. Right. And therefore, you know, uh, that's why we participate in all these struggles. Uh, the women that we, you know, a lot of time when we're on with now and we're fighting for the uh, free, ch you know, the right to choice and stuff like that, we make people understand in order for the women that we represent to even have choice, they got to have some economic freedom too. You know, you can't have a choice unless you have the basis economically mm -hmm. under this country to be able to have that choice. They don't even have health care, less more than anything else. So, yes, we are feminists. But at the same time, we will turn around and kick some of those feminist butts, too, because they just as reactionary to what we're about, because they don't want to even touch poor people. Mm -mm. Our thing is that we want a world where we can thrive and not barely survive. Yeah, see, we don't That's what take we're the, about. Oftentimes, we're, we're, we're uh, 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 approached about what, you know, the feminism has a connotation of, of, of uh, lesbian women comes up all the time. I love it. Favorite favorite discussion. Mm -hmm. Especially now since we have uh, marriages going on all over the, and I, and all I, over the country. And I applaud those you know, folks for doing and, and that. I, I think, I it's, think it's outstanding. You know, because, the marriages see, that are happening you know, in San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco, San Francisco New, 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 New York. York. And I well, hope they do something here. That's right. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, uh, people raise that issue where, you know, what is your feeling about homosexuality? Well, l let me tell you my feeling about poverty. See, because see, that's, that's the issue I have. What adults do in the, in the, the quiet and in their own homes yeah, Why is it your business unless you're trying to date one of them, you know? Mm -hmm. And, I'm, you, you know, the issue here for us is only one. And people come up with, you know, I have a problem. You know, feminism, you know, we have women. Do, do you have the same passion about same-sex relationships as you have about a woman who has lost her ability to live or keep her children or whatnot because those things were taken away? If you didn't have that fight then, don't come to the welfare rights door and try to raise this issue about feminism or gay or any of those kinds of things because we embrace everything that's got to do with fighting for equal rights. If there was a way for me to jump out here and to get to San Francisco, I'd be throwing rice. I support oh, yeah. all of it because we are for equal rights for everybody. And who is to stand up and say, well, you know, I, I like, this is my girlfriend, this is my, my boyfriend, this is my significant other for 20 or 30 years or five years, whatever the case may be, and they want to get married, well, I got a particular position against that? How dare you? How dare you? You got no right to make those kinds of, discri those kind of discriminatory remarks. People have the right to do what they need to do, and if you didn't have this fight about these other issues, don't bring that here. We get ugly on these kinds of issues, so usually, after we slap a two or three of them down, that's why I say we used to do good to cop, bad cop. They don't come to us anymore. Just one time they spread the message. Don't talk to them about that. They'll get mad. We had a member, and I, you know, I hope that she will come back out. She's been real ill. Frances Taylor, and we just love her, mm. that helped form the National Welfare Rights Union. Uh, she's out of Queens, New York. And Frances, I had to stay, you know, I had the opportunity to stay with her when I had to go to some activities in New York. And Frances said, um, Miriam, what is uh, your position on, on uh, gay, and gay people and lesbians and stuff like that? I said, what's their economic base? What are problems they having with economic? She said, that's the organization I want to be in. I said, but I don't give a who who's making love and all that stuff. That's not my problem. My problem is how can we get this economic plight off our backs? And that's what we got to be about. Mm -hmm. And so I, on the one hand, we really applaud that's right. uh, what is happening around the country. Go get them. Uh, that's right. As far as what Bush has moved to say that he wants to make this a constitutional <laughs> amendment and stuff like that, Outrage. people don't have the right to uh, uh, marry. That is uh, as far as same, uh, same sex and stuff like that. It's an outrage. It's outrage. It's an attack on all of us. And we have to remember, when they went, when Hitler went after uh, uh, certain people, you know, other people stood back. Didn't say nothing. And didn't say nothing. We have to remember our history or we're going to die with it. This has been educational. I thought I knew you all, but I learned a lot from you. And I, I want to ask you one more quick question. Quick? She's quick. Talking to you. She needs I'm talking to, talking to, talk to you. both of you. You mentioned Greta West, Francis Piven. Okay. You've had some links with university women and some people who have proclaimed feminist. What is, what's the good and bad of your relationship with the university? 
academics. Yeah, she said quick now. Quick. Okay. Well, Gita, when you look at Gita West, Gita is, Gita is a jewel among academic women. When you look at some of the, uh, some of our experience have, have, have been very good and some bad, be it on an international level or local level. Sometime, and let me tell you, a lot of people in welfare ranks have uh, a lot of degrees now too, you know. But uh, some have the notion of thinking that uh, I've obtained this education, you listen to me because I'm the professor, uh, the professional person when it comes to uh, your particular situation. Mm -hmm. And they get a rude awakening, you know, and some have stayed. And some of, when I look at people like uh, yourself, I look at our, our Silvio Duno, you know, Thank God the Sylvia is student. there with us because mm -hmm. a lot of days Maureen and I would not make it, you know, because she's organized when we're not, you know. We not know, we, you know, so on the one hand, I think they should take their talents and their skills that they have had the opportunity to obtain and go and work with poor people. Not trying to dictate to them, listen and learn from them and come out of there with, with their, what their skills are and what the skills are of the poor people to make all of them some better people. But, you know, they're going to come in there looking at us from the mountaintop. Okay. Well, we have to wrap up, and I just won't let you leave. I just want to thank you very much for being here and being thank part of this. Thank you for the this. invitation. Thank you. It's wonderful to hear you speak. You're giving us an opportunity to be with you again. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thanks.